Good evening, everyone. My name is Jamie Vassants. I'm the Visitor Engagement Coordinator at Soldiers Memorial Military Museum. Thank you for attending this evening's program, Women Making War, Female Confederate Partisans, Female Confederate Prisoners, and Union Military Justice. So um, first of all, uh, all three, I'm sorry, the Missouri History Museum and Soldiers Memorial are still open five days a week, uh, Wednesday through Sunday, 10 to 5 p.m. Uh, come by if you're feeling comfortable. We have a reduced capacity of 25% uh, right now, and we have some other security, uh, <laughs> some other safety measures in place, uh, disinfecting interactives and that kind of thing. Um, I want to thank our members for enabling us and the members of the Soldiers Memorial Giving Circle for enabling us to put on programs like this. Really appreciate your support. Uh, if you'd like to become a member or just sign up for our newsletter or anything like that, I'll put information about that in the chat right now. Uh, I have a few logistical things that we need to go over before we start the program this evening. So first of all, uh, there's closed captioning available. Um, if you hit the uh, three dots with more at the bottom of your screen, uh, there should be an option for closed captions down there. Um, it's automatically generated, so sometimes there are mistakes, but it's better than nothing. Uh, this will be about a 30 minute presentation with about 10 or 15 minutes for Q&A afterwards. If you have a question, uh, you can submit it at any time through the Q&A box uh, on your toolbar at the bottom there. And then we'll go through them at the end. Uh, if we don't have time to get to your question, uh, apologies. Usually we have time for all of them though. Uh, today's presentation is being recorded and it will be posted to Missouri Historical Society's YouTube page uh, after a few days. Uh, I think the link to that, yep, the link to that was in the chat. Uh, and finally, uh, your feedback is important. Uh, after you close out the webinar, it should automatically open up a uh, survey in your browser. And if you'd be willing to take just a few minutes to fill that out, we'd really appreciate your feedback. So with all that out of the way, uh, I'd like to introduce this evening's speaker. His name is uh, Thomas Curran. Um, he's the author of a book by the same name of the program uh, that just published last year. Uh, and he's gonna be telling us a little bit, bit about this topic as part of our uh, Women's History Month programming. So take it away. Greetings, everybody. Uh, thank you all for joining us. I'm glad you didn't have to travel to do it. You can do it from home. First of all, I want to thank Jamie. I want to thank the Missouri Historical Society and the Soldiers Museum for inviting me to give this presentation on a topic that I've really spent the last two decades with um, and has become near and dear to me. So I thought maybe I'd, I'd begin by setting the stage with a few reported incidents. Uh, in January 1862, the pro-union newspaper Missouri Democrat published an editorial attack on disloyal women in St. Louis who openly showed support for the Confederacy. The editorial asserted that these women seem to support or suppose they can do such things without impunity under the protection of womanhood. The time has come for disloyal persons, whatever their attire, must, must pay decent respect to that military authority which rebellion has rendered necessary in this city. Well, in March 1863, St. Louis's Provost Marshal General Franklin Dick reported to one of his superiors on several prominent women involved in both secret correspondence and in carrying on the business of collecting and distributing rebel letters. Dick wrote, these women are wealthy and wield great influence. They are avowed and abusive enemies of the government. They incite young men to join the rebellion. Their letters are filled with encouragement to their husbands and sons to continue the war. They convey information to them and by every possible contrivance, they forward clothing and other support to the rebels. In his post-action report, on the response to Confederate General Sterling Price's raid through Missouri in the fall of 1864, Union General William Rosecrans noted that previous to the invasion, women's fingers were busy making clothes for rebel soldiers out of goods plundered by the guerrillas. Women's tongues were busy telling Union neighbors their time was coming now. Union authorities did more than complain about the activities of disloyal women. In his post-war memoir, 
Confederate Captain Griffin Frost wrote about the women he encountered while in Union Army custody in St. Louis. Frost condemned the Yanks for making war on women. How he asked, how, how he asked, in the progressive age of the 19th century, could women be kept as political prisoners? Well, this project, as I suggested, had a long germination process. As a young scholar, I had been fascinated by stories of encounters between women, usually Confederate, and the military. Women like Belle Boyd, Rose O'Neill Greenhow, and a few other lesser known women I had come across serendipitously in my research. Moving to St. Louis set the stage for my discovery of the stories I tell in my book, Women Making War. In my research for a different project, I utilized a portion of the records of the military prisons in St. Louis and the nearby Alton military prison. I was familiar with the names of a few women arrested in St. Louis, but in these prison records, I began coming across names I had never seen before. I also uncovered stories or portions of stories suggesting a wide variety of activities that brought women under the scrutiny of the Union Army. I thought there might be a bigger story here, but while I had identified a few dozen women who had spent time in custody in St. Louis and at Alton, I needed more information. That led me to a review of the Missouri Democrat, which regularly reported the arrests of civilians and the comings and goings of soldiers and civilians in the military prisons. With that, I began to develop a database of women who spent time in custody in the region, which only grew with further research. Eventually, I identified more than 440 such women. I also began to see more clearly the issues raised by the women's activities and the Union Army's evolving response to these partisan women. The information I collected stood at odds with two different familiar narratives about women in the Civil War. The first holds that women on both sides were reluctant, in fact, they were resistant, to take part in the military conduct of the war. Even though they wished they could, because such action would violate the traditional gender norms of the day. Such, that, such actions would take them out of their acceptable sphere and place them in the public sphere occupied by men. The second relates specifically to Southern women. First, it portrays noble Southern men going off to fight the Civil War to protect home and family, especially women, from marauding Yankee invaders. As the Northern Army moved into the South, Southern, Southern women were depicted as helpless victims of the enemy. This narrative rarely acknowledged the women's partisan activities and their arrest and imprisonment for such. Women Making War argues that a significant number of Confederate women stepped out of their sphere and engaged in direct activities designed to further the Southern war effort. Much of what we know about these women comes from their records, the records generated when they were investigated and arrested by the Union Army. The activities women who spent time in custody of the Provost Marshal General in St. Louis, uh, the, arrest, the activities uh, they participated, they ranged from uh, minor offenses like publicly expressing support for the Confederacy to more serious infractions like spying, smuggling, acting as conduits for of the clandestine Confederate mail network, helping male prisoners escape, sabotage, and directly aiding the Confederate Army and guerrilla fighters. St. Louis's significance as a training and supply hub in the West and its location on the Mississippi River made it ripe for smuggling and spying activities share image with you here. Oops. There we go. Add to that the divided population in the city and state and the guerrilla warfare that plagued Missouri throughout the war, 
and a perfect storm existed for Confederate women to step into the fray in ways that they could support the war effort. Union Army officials took these activities seriously, especially as the war progressed. They did not see these actions simply as transgressions of expected general, gender behavior. These activities were of a treasonous nature. As a result, women for partisan activities in St. Louis shaped federal policy toward rebellious civilians. Understanding these activities adds another layer of complexity to our knowledge about the experience of Southern women during the war. The interaction between Union soldiers and hostile civilians, the additional challenges incarcerated women pose to the military prison system, and how we remember the conflict and women's roles. Stop sharing for a moment. The earliest arrests of women came in response to offenses that will seem minor by later standards. For instance, two women draped a rebel flag out of their apartment window, got them arrested. Several publicly sang secessionist songs and others uttered improper, meaning disloyal, language. A Mrs. Brunine destroyed a small United States flag in front of neighbors. And Margaret Ferguson's second visit to the Myrtle Street military prison to wave at prisoners in the windows secured for her a few hours in custody. Fanny Barron and Margaret Kelson came before the provost marshal for inducing one James Thomas Jilton to join a rebel band of bushwhackers. In the family of a Miss Bull found themselves under house arrest for about two weeks with guards at all the exits because someone allegedly waved a Confederate flag out of one of the house's windows to prisoners arriving from the Shiloh battlefield. At times, the circumstances of early arrests seem a bit comical. Mary Wolfe, arrested in September 1862, regularly taunted her unionist neighbors and allegedly asked her young son if he had enough secesh in him to hit their unionist neighbor's son on the head with a little hatchet. Lucinda Clark, reportedly a very quarrelsome woman who continually abused unionist neighbors, sang the version of the song, this version of the song Dixie. I wish I were in the land of cotton and see old Lincoln dead and rotten. Her wish that the Union folks ought to be shot for arresting secessionists did not deter the provost marshal from having her arrested. And a highly intoxicated woman made a public and disloyal spectacle of herself as she led two cows through the streets of St. Louis while loudly hurrahing for Jefferson Davis. The cases of most of the women arrested early in the war usually were dispensed with on, a same, on the same day of the arrest. And those women not let go within a few hours spent only a night or two behind bars. As the women, as the number of women prisoners expanded, the charges against them grew, grew more complicated and the methods of sentencing them more severe. Paralleling this growth was the dedication the women evinced in carrying out their work. The case, maybe I should say the case is, of Drusilla Sappington reveals both these processes. Born in July 1826, Sappington was the daughter of St. Louis area judge Ollie Williams, who according to one source was the cousin of two presidents, Zachary Taylor and James Buchanan. After her first husband died in the 1850s, Drusilla married William David Sappington and settled on his farm about 10 miles west of the city in St. Louis County. By 1860, William David owned land valued at $10,000 plus $2,560 worth of personal property. According to the 1860 slave census, he owned one 26-year-old male slave. 
After the war commenced, William David joined the Confederate Army, serving in the Fort uh, Missouri Cavalry. While his wife remained at home, fighting the war from behind the lines. Mrs. Sappington first came to the attention of federal authorities in August 1862, when they received a report that a camp of secessionists was recently upon her premises with her knowledge and consent. A visit by a patrol of some 70 soldiers turned up nothing. Nevertheless, Sappington, characterized as the wife of a bitter secessionist, now in the rebel army, complained that the men had killed all her ducks, turkeys, and chickens, and had stolen clothes, jewelry, and money, and almost made off with a bed. Ten days later, intelligence divulged by a man who had joined a band of guerrillas, but had second thoughts and turned himself in, confirmed that Sappington's house and property were being used by the rebels, not only with her consent, but her cooperation. A second visit to the Sappington property proved more fruitful. In early September, a Confederate officer and his staff were found quartered at the Sappington house and arrested. Sappington was not immediately taken into custody, but she would not go unpunished. For having given information to the traitors of the movement of the U.S. forces and having harbored and aided men in arms against the United States government, Missouri Provost Marshal General Bernard G. Farrar uh, ordered that Sappington swear an oath of parole and pay a bond of $2,000. Farrar further demanded that Sappington leave the state of Missouri and relocate to Massachusetts. Why he picked Massachusetts, I have no clue. From there, though, she was supposed to lodge monthly reports to Farrar by mail concerning her good behavior. When Sappington learned that she was about to be served with Farrar's order, she fled and headed for southern, southwestern Missouri and presumably Confederate lines and her husband. A few days later, 100 miles from the city, authorities found and arrested her and a female traveling companion, 23-year-old Elizabeth Siegler. The wife of David Francis Marion Siegler, Elizabeth, like Drusilla, had previously come to the attention of Union authorities, who banned her from visiting the prisoners at the Gratiot Street Military Prison in St. Louis, for using insulting language toward the guard of the prison and preaching up secession inside and outside the prison. Like William David Sappington, Siegler's husband also had joined the Confederate Army. In 1863, as a prisoner in the Alton Military Prison in Illinois, David Siegler sought to be released from custody and used as part of his plea that his wife had convinced him to join the rebel army in violation of an oath of loyalty he had given. Talk about throwing your wife under the bus. Well, in, on September 15th, Sappington and Siegler were returned to St. Louis and placed in a building behind the Gratiot Street prison. A picture of the prison here. So it's behind the structure, it's former medical college here. Instead of, and they, they put her in that building behind the Gratiot Street Prison instead of the main building with the male, male prisoners. Sappington did not let confinement stop her from aiding the Confederate cause. She and Siegler shared a room fashioned as a cell adjacent to another serving as a cell occupied by Absalom Grimes. A noted Confederate mail courier who recently had been captured in St. Louis and sentenced to be shot. The two women helped Grimes to escape confinement to resume his clandestine pursuits. Authorities had put Grimes in this building to isolate him from the general population. It actually led to his escape. The first floor room that held 
him shared a wall uh, with that of Sappington and Seagram. Both women knew Grimes and had helped him in his work in the past. The wall between the two rooms, described by Grimes as parlor, contained a folding door. And although it was securely closed, Grimes and the women could speak with each other through it. To escape, Grimes slipped through a hole in the floor created by the removal of three planks and then cut his way through a wall to the outside with tools he obtained. The cutting took more than one instance, and each time Grimes went into the hole, Sappington created the illusion that he was still in his room. By rocking a squeaky rocking chair that was in his room, uh, by way of a string attached to it that extended to her room through a crack in the secured door. So she's able to pull it and it's rocking and it's making this noise. Meanwhile, Mrs. Siegler was dancing about their room, uh, singing loudly, making other noise to cover up any noise made by Grimes. Thus he made his escape. And it appears that his two abettors never came under scrutiny for aiding. Well, the makeshift nature of the accommodations giving Sappington and Siegler while imprisoned reflect the unprepared state of the army when it came to female prisoners. Evidence suggests that the first few women arrested in St. Lu the St. Louis area in 1861 were held in rooms at Benton Barracks, a military training facility northwest of downtown. As more disloyal women faced arrest in 1862, however, they were sent to the Gratiot Street prison and eventually held in the main building. Because of the short dura duration of most women's imprisonment during this time, only a few spent more than a day or two in custody, federal authorities probably felt no pressing demands to designate extensive space for women prisoners or vice versa. The lack of accommodations might very well have explained the brief confinements. Whatever the situation, the Missouri Democrat reported in September 1862 that the prison furnishes very slender accommodations for the secession in crinoline. Contrary to the paper's assertion that a section of the Gratiot Street prison would soon be reserved for ladies, the sparse room allotted for women continued well into 1863. That would change. Before the end of the war, federal authorities used several confiscated private residences and built and the building across the street from the Gratiot Street Prison to hold females in custody. In addition, starting in 1863, women found guilty of serious offenses would be sent to the Alton Military Prison in Alton. Robinson left the Gratiot Prison about a month after her arrival. Her father, having posted a $1,000 bond on her behalf, not the $2,000 that was asked for, it's doubtful that Sappington ever traveled to Massachusetts. It still boggles my mind why Massachusetts. For in early 1863, records indicate that Sappington was in St. Louis. Evidently, the threat of further imprisonment or losing her father's money did not temper her commitment to the Confederacy. She probably was the ringleader of the band known as Mrs. Max Appington's Company, mentioned in the investigation of another St. Louisan in January 1863, and no doubt engaged in disloyal activities. In the middle of March 1863, Sappington again came under scrutiny when she paid a police officer to arrest and return to her her husband's slave who had been confiscated by the army and put to work building fortifications in St. Louis City. What transpired as a result is not evident in the record. But at the end of the month, the provost marshal of St. Louis ordered the commander of the Gratiot Street prison to release any Negro in the military prison belonging to Mrs. Sappington and to get a receipt. By then, Sappington had developed quite a reputation. For example, when a Mrs. Walton made a statement against a Mrs. Loring on the latter's Confederate sympathies, she stated that Mrs. Loring is as disloyal to our country 
as Mrs. Sappington. And when describing a particularly unruly prisoner, the matron of a female prison said that the woman was one of the most rebellious and insulting prisoners in my charge. In fact, the worst, save Mrs. Sappington. Gone with any identification of Drusilla Sappington through her husband's secessionist proclivities. Soon, Sappington again faced arrest. This time, she would be detained briefly in a residence temporarily used as a prison before being banished to the South and beyond federal lines with a group of Confederate women who had proved troublesome for Union authorities. These were the women who uh, Missouri Provost Marshal General Franklin Dick referred to in that March 1863 letter. In the letter, Dick further explained, the embarrassment is to know what to do with them once arrested. Once arrested. Their actions deserve serious punishment, but any long-term imprisonment for the women, something still very uncommon, would turn them into martyrs. The solution came in the form of General Orders Number 100, Instructions for the Government of Armies in the United States in the Field, adopted by the Army in April 1863. Also known as Lieber's Code, the document represented the first such code ever embraced by the nation's military, in fact, by any nation's military, for that matter. Written primarily by international law expert Francis Lieber, back to these images, oops, Went too far, written by uh, Francis Lieber, with the input of G Union General Henry Halleck, Lieber's code delineated in detail the rights and responsibilities of governments at war, soldiers in the field, and civilians in occupied territory. In practical terms, the code set guidelines for the Federal Army concerning how troops were to conduct themselves and what the Army expected of civilians they encountered as they marched into enemy territory. The code permitted military commanders to expel revolted citizens who refused to pledge themselves anew as citizens obedient to the law and loyal to the government during times of insurrection, civil war, and rebellion. The code also made women accountable for their actions, actions deemed treasonous as a matter of policy throughout the Union Army, thanks to the input of Henry Halleck, who while serving as military commander in St. Louis in 1862, had plenty of experience dealing with rebellious women. That experience compelled Halleck to insist that the code allow the army to treat disloyal women as it did disloyal men. By the time the code went into effect, Franklin Dick already had several of the women in question in custody in St. Louis. Authorities first arrested Margaret McClure, a wealthy widow who helped to facilitate the collection and distribution of contraband Confederate mail while engaging in other covert disloyal activities. They then converted her mansion on Chestnut Street into a temporary prison for women. Soon, Others gained, uh, joined her in custody, including the wives of several Confederate officers who had been detected corresponding with their husbands and others engaged in the clandestine mail enterprise. Drusilla Sappington's arrest came shortly before the departure of the exiled women. And while a specific new charge against her cannot be found to cause this action, an informant had reported to the Provost Marshal General in late April and early May that Sappington had been associating with a known smuggler who was under investigation. On May 13, 1863, Sappington and the other banished women boarded the steamer Bell Memphis and departed St. Louis for the South. Journeying to Memphis, they then traveled by rail to LaGrange, Tennessee. From there, they rode in 
cavalry escorted ambulances into Confederate occupied Mississippi, where in the town of Okalona, under a flag of truce, they were turned over to the Confederate army. The removal of these women beyond the lines represented the first of a series of group banishments of women departing from St. Louis that occurred in 1863. By the end of the year, expelling beyond the lines, women found guilty of serious treasonous activities had become a regular occurrence. It's kind of interesting if you follow the reports in the Missouri Democrat, each time the reporting gets smaller and smaller and smaller, it's just routine. And women will continue to be banished, banished through the rest of the war as well as in prison. Well, Drusilla Sappington's record with the federal military justice system ends here. But at some point by the spring of 1864, she returned to Missouri. In March, Lieutenant General Kirby Smith, commanding the Confederate Trans Mississippi Department, received a secret communication from Drusilla Sappington, written from St. Louis, concerning military affairs in Missouri, Indiana, and Illinois. Smith's aide-de-camp passed the message along to Major General Sterling Price, a former governor of Missouri who was preparing to launch a campaign to liberate his home state in the near future. That nothing more is known of Sappington's activities through the rest of the war is telling. No doubt she remained involved in aiding the Confederate war effort. The aide-de-camp's letter accompanying the dispatch Sappington sent treats this communication as routine. Had Sappington been caught in 1864, the penalty she received certainly would have been harsher than the two previous arrests. In that year, Provost Marshal General in St. Louis handled at least 200 arrested women. A charge of spying, especially leveled against a recidivist offender like Sappington, would have earned her a lengthy prison cell, probably in the Alton Military Prison in Illinois. Long-term prison sentences for women was something also made common through Lieber's Code. And you can definitely start measuring the longer term sentences after the code goes into effect. Sappington probably would have spent the rest of the war or most of it in military custody. After the war, she lived a quiet life until she passed away in Texas in 1906. I wish I had a photograph of her to share with you. That Sappington's partisan activities went undetected through the last year of the war was probably true for many Southern women who acted on their principles in the name of the Confederacy during the war. The vast majority of Confederate women, partisan women, for whom information is known, were caught. Their stories appear primarily in the records of the Union Provost Marshal General and Union prisons, and in contemporary newspaper accounts using information provided by Union military authorities. For disloyal women who avoided the scrutiny of the Union military justice, few records exist. exist. And I have to think there were quite a number who did avoid that, uh, that scrutiny. Well, the arrest, imprisonment, and in some cases banishment of Confederate women represented a response to the war these women waged on the federal government and the Union Army. From overtly sympathizing with and giving moral support to the Confederacy to more direct insurgency, such as smuggling communications and contraband, sabotage, spying, and even enlisting in the Confederate service, Southern women both expressed and acted on the politics they embraced. In doing so, these women impacted the war in many ways. Through their actions and deeds, Confederate women risked 
their personal liberty and lives to further their cause. Rather than being viewed as victims of the war or ignored altogether, these women should be recognized as public actors who hazard all in the name of the Confederacy. Thank you. I think we can open to questions now. Thanks, Tom. That was that's really interesting. We uh, we don't have any uh, audience questions yet. Uh, as a reminder to the audience, if you have any questions, you can use the Q and A box in your toolbar there. Um, while we wait for audience questions to roll in, though, um, something something I was reflecting on while you were speaking was um, in in the past few years, uh, there's been some discussion around uh, public monuments and statues. And I think through those discussions, a lot of people have learned about the, uh, the Daughters of the Confederacy and the origins of a lot of uh, Confederate statues and, and their role in, in kind of um, shaping the mythology of the lost cause. And, and a piece of the mythology of the lost cause is the a purity of Confederate women and their role as, as housekeepers and, and all this kind of stuff. Um, and so, so I guess, I guess what I found myself being surprised by was how uh, visible and vocal and public some of these actions were. Uh, and it makes me wonder, this might not be your area of expertise, uh, but, but it makes me wonder if, if people were seeing women slandering the union and public and uh, and whatever else <laughs> it um, worked, yes how how does that how does that go down the memory hole uh so to speak and um, it's there are a number of answers to that and that's something that i do investigate and i like that you started with this whole issue of the daughters of the confederacy and how they really helped to shape this narrative that we call the lost cause narrative um, in elevating the men who lost the war as heroes who wouldn't have lost if, well, they had a stronger army and more people and more supplies. And um, uh, they couldn't go out there and say, and we took our part too, because, you know, they were, as you said, they were portraying, women were being portrayed as, as these, these, you know, virtuous, you know, angelic women who were behind right. the scenes and being attacked by the Union Army. And, and they didn't even want to talk about them being arrested because there's a separate issue there. But, um, but it just kind of conflicted with that notion that the men were are noble and gallant and went off and fight. Well, why do the women need to fight if the men were doing that? And so okay. that's part of, part of the argument. But then this, this other part, well, what about the women who, who get arrested? The, the vast majority of the women we know about were ones that got arrested. We know about it from the records and they're put in prisons. Well, there's this whole narrative going on in the Civil War um, uh, reminiscences after the war, memoirs uh, coming from soldiers who were in prisons trying to say that our contribution to the war was just as significant as those people who fought. We, we were thrown into these hell holes and it was terrible and it was awful and everything. If you suddenly start getting this narrative and women were there too, it challenges that idea that it was so bad. And, and okay. I have to tell you, know, the, the, the places women's were kept as prison were a lot nicer than the ones the men were kept in. That's true. But still, when the war was going, oh, the women, they were recognized. And the things that were said about these Confederate women by loyalists, the Unionists, and soldiers, the Union Army, were pretty harsh. But the memory disappears. I think the Union Army after the war also wants to forget that they put women in prison. Too. Right. And, so, and so it kind of disappears. Um, it occasionally comes up. Sometimes it can't be ignored. And there are those few women who are elevated to high pedestals. I mentioned them at the beginning of the talk. Bell, Bell Boyd, Rose O'Neill Greenhouse. Um, but there are all these other women here, too. I mean, I've identified just in St. Louis 440 women who came into custody. There are a lot more that I came across that I just left out because they were investigated, but there just wasn't enough evidence to arrest them. And uh, and then, like I said, I'm sure there's a whole group of women out there who never, never came under suspicion. And, um, and then they kept their mouth shuts after the war, with few, few exceptions, few exceptions. Often when they did, they were tempered. What they really stress a lot is the, um, the banishment story, because that keeps them out of the prisons. And that's those Yankees doing terrible things to them and sending them off to the South. Oh, okay. So, so that's it. But we had women in the Alton prison who stayed there for months, sometimes over a year. Wow. 
And I, I, I suppose we, we know we're good at um, ignoring things that, that don't kind of fit our, fit our ideals or uh, fit our narratives. So, so I, could, I can see having grown up in that situation and having seen some of these actions happen, but then still kind of wanting to believe in the ideal of the Confederate mm -hmm. woman or, or whatever. It, I, 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 it's, it's tough. I, I think I think I can kind of understand the processes that get people here, but looking at the the story that's told and and then what you're talking about now, it's uh, yeah, a lot of dissonance. The, the one the one woman who really gets celebrated in St. Louis is is Margaret McClure, who is at the center of things. And you know one of the one of the best sources I had was was Absalom Grimes' memoir. He is really candid. He's up front and he talks about these women and praises them and says their activities. And he, he talks about, he doesn't mention uh, Sappington and Siegler by name, but they're the only other two women in prison at the time. And stuff that's in their record kind of conforms that it's, it, it okay. was, and, um, and, uh, but then he talks, he talks about Margaret McClure and what, a, you know, what a rough, wonderful rebel woman she was. And, um, and then he has, he has an, an aunt who is also part of his, uh, network and various other people so uh, so you know it's, it's interesting that that he's very open about it but right. he can't really talk about his network if he doesn't bring the women in because the women were key parts of the network behind the scenes and often because they could be overlooked often they hid letters hundreds of letters under their skirts oh and you know the soldiers weren't going to go looking for them so. right. It's like we actually have a, an audience question. Uh, what were the locations of the Alton and uh, Gratit? Gratit? Is that right? Gratit. Gratit, Gratit is the uh, prison. Um, the Gratit Street prison, there's still a little bit of Gratit Street left. And uh, where the prison was, if you go downtown and it's the parking lot of the Purina facility down there, that's where the prison itself was. It had been a medical college, McDowell Medical College. And, uh, uh, Dr. McDowell absconded after the war. He, he went off and joined the Confederacy. He left it behind and it was confiscated and converted into, into a prison, as well as uh, a slave pen that was used by a guy named Lynch, who, uh, who you know, he kept his slaves there uh, before he brought them up to the courthouse to sell them on the steps. And, um, and that was used. That's the Myrtle Street prison. Myrtle Street doesn't, ex well, Myrtle Street exists, but it's now Clark Avenue. And so... Uh, the Myrtle Street prison was right across the street from the northeast corner of Bush Stadium, right about there, um, uh, give or take a few feet. <laughs> so, and, uh, and uh, those buildings are long since gone. They've long since been turned, torn down. I know of at least three private residences that were used. One Margaret McClure's house was used not only for her and the group of women that she was banished with, but it was used again for a while after that. Um, there was a larger house on St. Charles Street. Gosh, if you know anything about downtown St. Louis, St. Charles Street comes and goes. And um, and I think where it was is, is, is now just a solid building. You can't find it anymore. And another one, I'm not sure exactly what the address was. Uh, the Alton Prison, you know, a lot of people go to the where they have the Alton Prison Monument in Alton, where there's some stones and everything and say, oh, this is where the prison was and it's high above the you know looking down the road to the river actually the prison was down on the river okay one of the problems with it was it was actually condemned and closed down prior to the war it'd been a federal a state penitentiary and uh, then it was reopened when there was a big big demand to imprison soldiers it wasn't until 1863 that women were sent there for the first time uh, because they were being arrested in Tennessee and they didn't know what to do with them in Tennessee. So they sent them up to Alton to be held. And, uh, and then women from Missouri ended up getting sent in 64 and 65. Huh. So I hope that answers, answers the question. I think it more, more than. Okay. Uh, the same attendee asks, uh, did the Sappingtons live in present day Crestwood uh, on Sappington Road? I'm not sure. I know there's the Sappingtons. In fact, you know, I'm, I'm speaking from the school where I teach at Aquarius Academy and, and just down the street from Sappington Road. I'm not sure. The Sappington name is all over the place in Missouri. And, it, it, you know, some of them are related, some aren't. I know there were Sappingtons who were governors. And I actually had a chance to speak with one of the descendants of uh, Drusilla Sappington. Um, 
And, uh, and I asked about the connection and he said, as far as he knew, they weren't connected with the, the governors who were there before the civil war. Um, and I know there's, you know, Sappington's not live far from here. I've been trying to find where William Davis house was located. And, um, and I just haven't been able to locate it on any of the old maps. I know there's one from 1857 that, uh, actually I think the Missouri, <laughs> the Missouri historical society is, is made available. Um, I just can't find it. Love to know. Well, you know, one of the things I get asked a lot, you know, I've given other presentations uh, on my earlier research and, um, you know, in terms of you know, the political involvement, you know, part of what I argue is that these women were acting politically. They had a, you know, a cause, uh, whether it was, you know, subconsciously or she was, they were really into the politics of it. And in a time where women couldn't vote, they were acting politically. Well, I've had people ask me, well, was this a stepping stone for some of these women later to get involved in the women's rights movement? And I haven't found a single one who made that change. I can't say that they didn't, but it's just not there. It's just not there that I've been able to find. And so, and so I have to say no when I'm asked that. And um, one of the other questions uh, uh, asks, well, what about, you know, were there any unseemly done things done against the women in the prisons? And, uh, and again, there's something where, um, except for one instance I found where, uh, male soldier was peeking through a crevice. Um, I really haven't found any, any you know, terrible things like that. I can't say it didn't happen and often things like that went unreported, but often they were reported in the third person by other people that this stuff, this stuff was going on. And I had sure. to reference to other people. Griffin Frost was an incredible observer and he reported everything about the way women were treated and he says nothing about it. I was actually gonna ask, um, uh, you, you said that some people were held at Benton Barracks, uh, and I know uh, Benton Barracks was a, a, a contraband camp, and that uh, U.S. colored troops were uh, organized out of, out of there, if I'm not mistaken. Um, was there any controversy about that at the time, or am I reading the trope of, of fear of black male sexuality? Am I reading that too far in the past? That was only right at the beginning of the war. The very first few women who... Uh, they had to keep overnight and they didn't have a place to put them and they didn't want to put them in the prison with the men. So they, they sent them there. And, um, there were only a few, you know, prior to 1863, there were only a few women who were held for more than a few nights. Um, you know, most of them, most, most of them were actually released in one day. And, uh, you know, they, they, they swore their oath of allegiance. You know, things are got serious in 1863. Um, they swore their oaths of allegiance and they, they promised they wouldn't do it again. That didn't mean they didn't, you know, they, they, they abided by that, but they, uh, they were let go after, you know, sometimes they were kept for a day or two, uh, maybe three. Uh, there, there's a real change with the exception of, well, I think well, actually, uh, Priscilla Sappington is arrested. She's kept for about a month. And I think, I'm not sure about Mrs. Siegler, if she gets let go earlier, um, they saw, you know, because it was something that happened at her house as Drusilla is the real instigator and everything else suggests that too. Um, you know, she was held for about a month, but we really don't get any kind of long-term imprisonments until we get after uh, that spring of 1863 when Lieber's Code, the General Order Number 100 goes into effect. And, uh, and then things are really gonna start escalating in St. Louis, so. Uh, at the end of the war, did the women receive pardons? Some of them did. Yeah, some of, some of them received pardons. Some of them were there, you know, part of their sentence was that they were to be imprisoned until the end of the war. And often they were let to go earlier than that. It was believed that they were, you know, they had mended their ways. There were a few women who received long sentences um, and they were sent to the Alton prison once they got that long sentence. And uh, there were a few that were pardoned by Lincoln, uh, and then one was pardoned, pardoned by Grant. And to my knowledge, I don't think Grant has pardon powers. You know, he was general at the time, not president. Um, and then a few uh, were pardoned by, uh, by Andrew Johnson. But that was, that was nearing the end of the war or after that, that happened. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, yeah, there were some women who were let go. Some were let go for health reasons. Um, so and some finished their sentences. One woman refused to pay her the fine she was charged. She, she had the means to pay it, but she, so she, they kept her in jail for two extra months <laughs> because 
she wanted to make a make a statement. But. Right. <laughs> well, if we don't have any other audience questions, we might wrap it up there. Um, thank, thanks to everyone who tuned in today. Thanks again to you for uh, for presenting. It's thank you. Fascinating topic that I really I really didn't know anything about. So. Okay. If anybody's interested, you know, if you don't mind me giving a pitch to the book, it's available. So we just about to local bookstore and go out and, and, and order it through there if they don't have it and tell them they should have it on stock. <laughs> so there's always, but, uh, but anyway, thank you. Thank you. So, um, like I mentioned before, when you close out the, uh, the presentation, there will be a quick survey in your browser if you'd be willing to fill that out. Uh, I also need to plug our future programs. So uh, on, actually, could I get the, uh, the last slide up, please? Oh, certainly. So on uh, Tuesday, March 30th at 11 a.m., we have Twain the Humanitarian, uh, and that's gonna be about Mark Twain's evolving views on race over time. Uh, and then on Thursday, April 1st, 6.30 p.m., we have Unbelievable St. Louis April Fool's Day edition. Uh, so the community tours manager, Amanda Clark, is going to uh, share some kind of wild, unbelievable stories about St. Louis history, and uh, one of them is going to be false. Uh, so it's up to the audience to kind of <laughs> try to find the lie. So that should be fun. Uh, thanks again to everybody for tuning in, and we'll see you in the next one. Good night.